Uh, next speaker is Jim Kettner. This is one that I actually taught in class, so I know he's a really good student. Had a lot of good students in his classes, as I recall. And I was teasing Jim earlier today because I looked at the schedule and he's been in a lot of different places. I said, Jim, can't you hold a job? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're happy to have you here, Jim. Yeah. for me, uh, and I was a non-traditional student living in uh, Cedar Rapids, commuting from there daily. Uh, I was a math major, working on a PhD in mathematics, I remember a little bit about my algebraic topology, math degree, and uh, I was, I, these folks weren't getting jobs. If they got a PhD in math, they went and taught in community colleges. Well, I've been teaching in a community college since 68, and I didn't want to do that for a, few, a couple thousand dollars, maybe more a year. I, you, you become a, a, a scholar in math or statistics because you like to solve problems and you want to make a contribution to society, and that is some sort of a contribution, but it's not uh, what I wanted to do. I wanted, I, I love problems. So, uh, as a math student, in the, you had to take two courses outside of math to get the PhD. Uh, one of those courses I took was Fortran, and incidentally, I still use Fortran to this day. <laughs> I, I probably could get a full-time job as a Fortran programmer today, but I, and I don't want to do that. But I still use my Fortran that I learned here at Iowa, and I also took this course in the Department of Statistics from uh, Whole Port and Stone, uh, elementary probability theory, theorem, theory, with uh, John Birch. I liked that class. Uh, it was fun. The problems were interesting. And I thought John did a really nice job presenting it. So, and since I wasn't sure what was going on in math at the time, I decided I'd motor in and talk to the chair of the Department of Statistics and see if maybe there was a way I could have an assistantship for a while, a year, so I could see what statistics was all about. So I motored into Pogue's office, and he looked at me for a while, and he said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Kepner. He said, you study out of the Bible, introduction to math, stat, by Logan Craig, do every problem in that book before fall, and I'll give you an assistantship. So I thought, well, I was, okay. So I got the book, went home, and I did it. I, I did all those problems, every one of them. It's a, been a great teaching resource for me, because what I've done with students, undergraduates and graduates, is when they need to practice something for a while, I give them a copy of Hogan Craig, I give them my solutions. It's, it's been a wonderful teaching device for me. In any case, I walk in, I have all these pages of stuff that I've done over the last five, six months, whatever it was. I come in and I said, I did it, here I am. And uh, he never looked at all those pages. <laughs> all he said, okay, you can start. So that was my introduction to statistics and uh, Bob Hogan. The professors that I had, some of them for multiple courses, for example, uh, Jim Broffitt here, but uh, were John, the late John Birch, Jim Broffitt, John Cryer. If, where is Cryer? I hear, let me see. Good to see you again. Uh, Russ Lent, 
Ron Randalls, Tim Robertson, and George Woodward. Uh, my PhD committee was, well, I did my dissertation with Ron Randalls. Um, Bob Hogue was on there. Jim Broffitt was on the committee. H.D. Uh, Hoover was on the committee. And I don't know who the other person was. Uh, Randalls, oh, Robertson. How could I forget him? Tim Robertson. So it, those were exciting times, not only the meetings for the dissertation the planning and, and periodic checks to make sure I knew what I was doing. Oak would invariably take these things over and ask all of the questions you could possibly think about involving complete insufficiency. <laughs> okay, as a student here, I had three areas of, of study that I really kind of liked. I liked isotonic regression, and I spent a lot of time, not, we didn't have a class of it, uh, in, in Tim Robertson's office with Tim, studying from, I uh, forget what book it was, uh, yeah, the, Bar Barlow, Bremner, Bartholomew, and Brunk, the four Bs, <laughs> uh, and, and I learned a lot, but I, and I well, sort of like the problems related to isotonic regression that involved ordered alternatives, uh, but uh, that was not to be the area I went into. I actually uh, liked non-parametric statistics really well, and Ron Randalls was willing to take me as a student. So he got me started on a problem involving bivariate symmetry. Now that's just bivariate exchangeability. You have two random variables. Uh, the, the, the joint distribution, x1, x2, has the same distribution as x2, x1. Uh, and, and we had gotten a nice, uh, a couple of nice uh, results and got those published in two separate uh, manuscripts. But it was shortly after I got out of Iowa in, in the real world, but where I really came to appreciate interchangeability. So this is a very important topic. Uh, you know, and as it relates to non-parametric statistics and, and other uh, areas as well. As you know, if you have n continuous, independent, identically distributed random variables, uh, the rank vector, you rank those guys from 1 to n, that rank vector is uniformly distributed over the first uh, n integers. And uh, the exchangeability allows that same result without the assumption of independence. It's a little weaker than independence. And I have to tell you, uh, that has been a wonderful tool that I've used over and over again. Even the idea of taking your independent random variables, your, your vectors of variables, and then standardizing them, you create, if you believe in correlations, you create a, a, a exchangeability under the standard kinds of transformations. So suddenly, you can rank those things, and, and the, all the mathematics for, for non-parametric statistics becomes much easier. So I really liked uh, uh, the exchangeability, but not at the two level where I did it in my thesis. The other thing that caught my eye right after I got here was the idea of adaptive designs. Hope, uh, Doris Fisher, and Ron Randalls published a paper in Jazz in 1995 where they came up with this really clever idea that I liked. Uh, and it's actually been the basis for a lot of my work in the last 15 years, believe it or not. The idea was, how do you pick the statistic? How do you, what is the model that you are assuming underlies the population from what you sample? Is it Right-tailed, symmetric, is it heavy-tailed, is it normal, is it skewed? Uh, and what Hogue and uh, the Fisher and Randalls did, they said, they showed that you could take a look at the data and use a couple statistics, maybe a location and a, uh, uh, a statistic for shift or skewness, and Depending upon the values you get for that statistic, you could claim that this was the plausible model to use for the analysis. Do the analysis, 
And if you wanted an alpha level test, even though you looked at the data to make the decision, you still had an alpha level test at the end. This was cool. I really liked it. Because as an applied statistician, it, it got to irritating me more and more over the years. Every, nobody wants to do that. They want to go collect their data, and they want to mine the data, and then when they write the reports, they don't ever want to use the word post hoc. So you're always looking for ways to help people get the result that they want fairly and honestly. And something that allows you to look at the data and make a decision is very handy. So with that said, those are the three things that really caught my eye when I was here as a student. Now I'd like to relate those to some of the things that I've been doing lately that uh, you might find of some interest. Start with a very simple problem. Let us be a binomial random variable. Uh, and be the sample size. And uh, the question is, can we find the smallest n sample size for which there exists some number, b, so that the probability of falling in the rejection region under the uh, null hypothesis is less than or equal to some pre-specified value alpha, and at the same time, the probability of falling in that rejection region at some point in the research hypothesis parameter space is at least some other number, 1 minus beta, say 0.8, this is the typical one that physicians and, and others use. Now, I, I wanted, to, I needed, as part of the cooperative groups, I was a, a statistician for, my, my coming out party in biostatistics started in 95. Uh, I started working for the children's, uh, the pediatric oncology group. Later it became the, uh, merged with the children's cancer group in Los Angeles and became the pediatric oncology group. And then I moved on and did the uh, gynecological oncology group in, uh, in uh, Buffalo, New York when I was with the Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Um, I needed, I wanted to be able to, to compute, to find designs that would satisfy my conditions easily. There were only a few, and they were only a few existed, and they were all either by Richard Simon at the NCI, which were of one certain type, which I'll talk about in a second, or they were from Guyon, the famous uh, group statistician, and he only had about five or six of these things. I wanted to be able to get a design quickly. Physicians were coming to me wanting designs. I wanted to be able to get them quick and easy, and I couldn't do that. So, what uh, I started looking at was, suppose that uh, we look at the data twice. Remember, this, this is, uh, I'm going to show you ultimately how to do legal, what I call legalized cheating. I think Hope referred to it, uh, the group called it that as well. Suppose what I do is I go out and I collect N1 experimental units, give them the treatment, and if my binomial random variable is big enough, I'm going to conclude that the research hypothesis is true. If it isn't, if I fall in the region of indecision, I'm going to come down, look at N2 more experimental units, and take a look at the sum of those two binomial random variables, and if it's extreme enough, I'll conclude that the research hypothesis is true. Otherwise, I won't. I'll conclude that the null hypothesis is true. And of course, we never conclude that the null hypothesis is true. It's just convenient to talk about. Okay, if you want more of these problems, or more of these uh, where you actually can use a web application, I've made my web, a number of my programs free to the public. And you can go to cryptnet.net uh, slash Kepner and you can do a whole bunch of things that, are, that I'm going to talk about shortly. This is a, a design, I call it a type 1 design, that stops early only for efficacy. This is what a design looks like in the simplest possible case, where you stop early for futility. This is a Simon design, like I mentioned a second ago. If at the first stage your, your test statistic isn't big enough, looks like you're not going to be successful with the trial, you stop the trial. Conclude that all hypothesis is true. Otherwise, you approve some more patients, make a, or subjects, and make a, a 
recompute your statistic and see what happens. If it's in the rejection region, you uh, conclude the research hypothesis is true. Okay, there's a third design, which now you're starting to see things that aren't real easy to come by. This is my favorite. This is what I call the type 3 design. This allows me to stop early for either efficacy, this route, or futility, this route. Why do I like that design? Well, if a, I'm kind of a pure ethicist, and uh, I like the ethics of this design. I, can, I don't want to accrue patients to a study if I know the study's not going to be show, show, show a difference. I don't want to waste patient resources on it. So I want to be able to stop early if it's not going to work. Also, I want to stop early if, it, if, if it's a home run early on, because I don't want to waste my resources on this. I want that, that treatment, whatever it is, to go against the standard of care and uh, use my patients in that, that regard. So I think this is the, 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 the best of all the worlds. And you can get designs like this on my web application too. Now, envision not just two stops. Envision case stops. Subject to the constraint that the number of experimental units at the first stage is at least as large as the number of experimental units at the second stage, and so forth down the line. This can, right up here. What I've been able to show over the years that it involved anything is that, first of all, the sum of the sample sizes of those case stops is bounded above by the sample size for the one stage design. Not only that, but it's almost always less than that. So I save resources, total resources, to begin with. But the <coughs> real kicker here is this next row, the next two rows. The significance level of that K stage design is bounded above by the alpha level for the one stage test. And the power of that K stage test is bounded below by the power of the one stage test, the purest form of legalized cheating that I can think of. I can keep looking at the data all the way along. And when I, the, my worst case scenario is still good. So, and there are other things, and I'm not going to go through all the details because it's, it's a large body of work to, to worry about. But you could spend alpha or one minus beta, depending upon the type of design. Uh, it has low average sample number. That's something that uh, the people that do these designs care a lot about. So the average sample number is the expected number under the null plus the expected number under the research hypothesis divided by two. And I don't know, know why that, anybody thinks that's a good idea. But that, they use that. So. Uh, and the designs, even though you're looking at K stages, and I haven't told you what K is, even though you can stop at uh, uh, K times, are, are either equivalent or essentially equivalent to the uniformly most powerful test, that one, one stage test. Um, but we're not done. Incidentally, K is actually can be a very large number. It, it's uh, it's a, in some of the papers that I wrote, and it's a function of B and, and uh, delta, but it's it, it can be very large. So you can stop a lot of times. Stopping isn't always a good thing in Sinelli. I wasn't going to even mention that, but just so you know, I know what I'm doing. I, <laughs> you don't always want to stop a crop. If, if you're counting survival for some reason, for example, and you're looking at one year survival, you don't want to stop a study for a year while you're waiting for a result. But much of the time, stopping is a good thing. Okay, what extensions do we have? First of all, everything that I just told you about extends the two-sample problem, uh, where you're 
to have an experimental uh, group and a control group. No hypothesis is that the two are equal, and you want to show, say, the one side and all the alternative. Uh, everything slides right through. All the theorems that I just described to you, everything works. You legalize cheating in that problem as well. Um, This is an example, my favorite, the type 3 design, for a, 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 a two-sample problem. You accrue N1 patients to the experimental group, N1 patients to the control group, compute a difference of two binomials, and check this if you're in a rejection region, or if you're not likely to succeed, you fall in the uh, indeterminate region, you go down and prove some more patients N2 into each of the groups. On the same constraints, N1 is bigger than or equal to N2, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and you can get these designs. I can't remember whether I have those on the website or not. Uh, probably do. I think I do. Um, one has to ask the question, why did you have N1? Why did you start with it ordering N1 bigger than or equal to N2, dot, dot, dot. And, uh, be honest with you, I have no idea why I did that. I, I was just trying to solve a problem. I wanted to get those designs quick and easy, and I was able to uh, do it, what it took to, to get some theorems that allowed me to do that easily. Uh, but I've been asked that question many times, and, and part of the answer is this. That ordering of those sample stages, uh, the sample size for the various stages, affects the points that go into the rejection region. The, uh, the way I did it favors the research hypothesis. If you do the ordering <coughs> the other way, N1 less than or equal to N2, da, 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 that picks points that tend to favor the null hypothesis. Which way is the better way? I don't know. The, the, what actually happens is that the probabilities with these extra points, if you're moving around from one way or the other way, actually have very low probability. So you're not affecting things very much in either, in either case. The other thing is, it, it begs the question is, is there an intelligent way to put points in a, in a rejection region? And I think, that, I, to my knowledge, I don't know that that problem is. So. Oh, and there are other things we can do. You can detect one, uh, the, uh, the inequality P less than P naught. And you simply use the fact that n minus uh, a binomial random variable is still a binomial random variable. You can conduct two-sided tests. You can do uh, tests for non-inferiority. You can fail to prove deviations from uh, bioequivalence. Uh, there are all. You can do. I've got programs done that do the hypergeometric sampling. Turn the. It's, it's, these are exhaustive searches. And so, if you want it, I can tell you how I did it, but. Uh, I'm not missing anything along the way. I look at every one until I get the one that so so solves the input constraints. Okay. I'm being told it's the end, but it's not the end. I can't stop here. Thanks.